Section 34 of the Memorable Thoughts of Socrates by Xenophon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ian Verley. The Memorable Thoughts of Socrates by Xenophon. Translated by Edward Baishi. Book 4. Chapter 3. Proofs of a Kind Superintending Providence. What returns of gratitude and duty men ought to make to God for his favors. An honest and good life, the best song of thanksgiving, or the most acceptable sacrifice to the deity. As Socrates considered virtue and piety as the two grand pillars of a state, and was fully persuaded that all other qualifications whatever, without the knowledge and practice of these, would, instead of enabling men to do good, serve, on the contrary, to render them more wicked and more capable of doing mischief. For that reason, he never pressed his friends to enter into any public office until he had first instructed them in their duty to God and mankind. But, above all, he endeavored to instill into their minds pious sentiments of the deity frequently displaying before them high and noble descriptions of the divine power, wisdom, and goodness. But seeing several have already written what they had heard him say in divers occasions upon this subject, I will content myself with relating some things which he said to Euthydemus when I myself was present. Have you never reflected, Euthydemus, on the great goodness of the deity in giving to men whatever they want? Indeed, I never have, answered he. You see, replied Socrates, how very necessary light is for us, and how the gods give it to us. You say true, answered Euthydemus, and without light we should be like the blind. But because we have need of repose, they have given us the night to rest in, the night which of all times is the fittest for repose. You are in the right said Euthydemus, and we ought to render them many praises for it. Moreover, continued Socrates, as the sun is a luminous body, and by the brightness of his beams discovers to us all visible things, and shows us the hours of the day, and as, on the contrary, the night is dusky and obscure, they have made the stars to appear, which, during the absence of the day, mark the hours to us by which means we can do many things we have occasion for. They have likewise made the moon to shine, which not only shows us the hours of the night, but teaches us to know the time of the month. All this is true, said Euthydemus. Have you not taken notice, likewise, that having need of nourishment, they supply us with it by the means of the earth? How excellently the seasons are ordered for the fruits of the earth, of which we have such an abundance, and so great a variety, that we find not only wherewith to supply our real wants, but to satisfy even luxury itself. This goodness of the gods, cried Euthydemus, is an evidence of the great love they bear to men. What say you, continued Socrates, to their having given us water, which is so necessary for all things? for it is that which assists the earth to produce the fruits that contributes with the influences from above to bring them to maturity. It helps to nourish us, and by being mingled with what we eat, makes it more easily got ready, more useful, and more delightful. In short, being of so universal an use, is it not an admirable providence that has made it so common? What say you to their having given us fire, which defends us from cold, which lights us when it is dark, which is necessary to us in all trades, and which we cannot be without, in the most excellent and useful inventions of men? Without exaggeration, said Euthydemus, this goodness is immense. What say you, besides, pursued Socrates, to see that after the winter of the sun comes back to us, and that proportionably, as he brings the new fruits to maturity, 
he withers and dries those whose season is going over. That after having done us this service, he retires that his heat may not incommode us. And then, when he is gone back to a certain point, which he cannot transgress without putting us in danger of dying with cold, he returns again to retake his place in this part of the heavens, where his presence is most advantageous to us. And because we should not be able to support either cold or heat, if we passed in an instant from one extreme to the other, do you not admire that this planet approaches us and withdraws himself from us by so just and slow degrees that we arrive at the two extremes without almost perceiving the change? All these things, said Euthydemus, make me doubt whether the gods have anything to do but to serve mankind. One thing puts me to a stand, that the irrational animals participate of all these advantages with us. How? said Socrates. And do you then doubt whether the animals themselves are in the world for any other end than for the service of man? What other animals do, like us, make use of horses, of oxen, of dogs, of goats, and of the rest? Nay, I am of opinion that man receives not so much advantage from the earth as from the animals. For the greatest part of mankind live not on the fruits of the earth, but nourish themselves with milk, cheese, and the flesh of beasts. They get the mastery over them, they make them tame, and use them to their great advantage in war and for the other necessities of life. I own it, said Euthydemus, for some of them are much stronger than man, and yet are so obedient to him that he does with them whatever he pleases. Admire yet further the goodness of the gods, said Socrates, and consider that as there is in the world an infinite number of excellent and useful things, but of very different natures, they have given us external senses which correspond to each of these sensible objects, and by means of which senses we can perceive and enjoy all of them. They have, besides, endued us with reason and understanding, which enableth us to discern between those things that the senses discover to us, to inquire into the different natures of things useful and things hurtful, and so to know by experience which to choose and which to reject. They have likewise given us speech, by means whereof we communicate our thoughts to each other, and instruct one another in the knowledge of whatever is excellent and good, by which also we publish our laws and govern states. In fine, as we cannot always foresee what is to happen to us, nor know what it will be best for us to do, the gods offer us likewise their assistance by the means of the oracles. They discover the future to us when we go to consult them and teach us how to behave ourselves in the affairs of life. Here Euthydemus, interrupting him, said, And indeed these gods are in this respect more favorable to you than to the rest of mankind, since, without expecting you to consult them, they give you notice of what you ought or ought not to do. You will allow, therefore, that I told you true, said Socrates when I told you there were gods, and that they take great care of men. But expect not that they will appear to you, and present themselves before your eyes. Let it suffice you to behold their works, and to adore them, and be persuaded that this is the way by which they manifest themselves to men. For among all the gods that are so liberal to us, there is not one who renders himself visible to confer on us, his favors. And that supreme God, who built the universe, and who supports this great work, whose every part is accomplished in beauty and goodness, he, who is the cause that none of its parts grow old with time, and that they preserve themselves always in an immortal vigor, who is the cause, besides, that they inviolably obey his laws with a readiness that surpasses our imagination. He, I say, 
is visible enough in the so many wondrous works of which he is author. But our eyes cannot penetrate even into his throne to behold him in these great occupations, and in that manner it is that he is always invisible. Do but consider that the sun, who seems to be exposed to the sight of all the world, does not suffer us to gaze fixedly upon him, and whoever has the temerity to undertake it is punished with sudden blindness. Besides, whatever the gods make use of is invisible. The thunder is lanced from above. It shatters all it finds in its way. But we see it not fall. We see it not strike. We see it not return. The winds are invisible, though we see the desolations they daily make, and easily feel when they grow boisterous. If there be anything in man that partakes of the divine nature, it is his soul, which, beyond all dispute, guides and governs him, and yet we cannot see it. Let all this, therefore, teach you not to neglect or disbelieve the deity because he is invisible. Learn to know his presence and power from the visible effects of it in the world around you. Be persuaded of the universal care and providence of the all-surrounding deity from the blessings he showers down upon all his creatures. And be sure to worship and serve this god in a becoming manner. I am sure said Euthydemus, I shall never derogate from the respect due to the gods, and I am even troubled that every man cannot sufficiently acknowledge the benefits he receives from them. Be not afflicted at that, said Socrates, for you know what answer the Delphian oracle is wont to return to those who inquire what they ought to do in order to make an acceptable sacrifice. Follow the custom of your country, says he to them. Now, it is a custom received in all places for every man to sacrifice to them according to his power. And by consequences, there is no better nor more pious a way of honoring the gods than that, since they themselves ordain and approve it. It is indeed a truth that we ought not to spare anything of what we are able to offer, for that would be a manifest contempt. When, therefore, a man has done all that is in his power to do, he ought to fear nothing and hope all. For from whence can we reasonably hope for more than from those in whose power it is to do us the greatest good? And by what other way can we more easily obtain it than by making ourselves acceptable to them? And how can we better make ourselves acceptable to them than by doing their will. This is what Socrates taught, and by this doctrine, which was always accompanied with an exemplary devotion, he greatly advanced his friends in piety. End of section 34. Recording by Ian Verley.